Hi everyone and welcome to the event. My name is Grace and I'm the events producer at University Bookstore in Seattle, the largest independent bookstore in the region. We're proud to partner with University of Washington Press tonight to bring you this fascinating discussion of author and environmentalist B.J. Cummings' new book, The River That Made Seattle, A Human and Natural History. You can purchase signed copies of the book from University Bookstore's website, or you can now shop in our stores. We're excited to be open to the public again. To see our new hours, please check our website. The books have been selling through, and we will be scheduling another signing with BJ next week, so please bear with us if there is a slight delay in fulfillment. Using previously unpublished accounts by Indigenous people and settlers, B.J. Cummings' compelling narrative restores the Duwamish River to its central place in Seattle and Pacific Northwest history. Writing from the perspective of environmental justice and herself a key figure in river restoration efforts, Cummings vividly portrays the people and conflicts that shape the region's culture and natural environment. She conducted research with members of the Duwamish tribe, with whom she has long worked as an advocate. She shares the river story as a call for action in aligning decisions about the river and its future with values of collaboration, respect, and justice. B.J. Cummings is founder of the Duwamish River Cleanup Coalition and previously served as executive director of Sustainable Seattle. She's currently the manager of community engagement for the Superfund Research at the University of Washington. Tonight, BJ will be joined by Ken Workman, the great, great, great grandson of Chief Seattle, and Louise Jones Brown, a sixth generation descendant of pioneer settler Jacob Maple, for a conversation moderated by historian and author Jennifer Ott. Tonight's reading and discussion will be followed by about 15 to 20 minutes of Q&A. If you have any questions for them at any time during the event, please type it in your questions field and they will answer them after the presentation. And now please join me in welcoming B.J. Cummings. Hello, Grace, thank you so much um, for welcoming me here today. Uh, it's, I'd also like to extend uh, my gratitude to Ken Workman, one of our guests tonight, and to all of the members of his Duwamish tribe for hosting all of us who, who are here in the greater Seattle area on their family's traditional Duwamish land. Thank you. Um, I'd like to begin with a question for our audience, which is, why are you here? Why get online on a beautiful evening to talk about a river um, that's been all but forgotten up until about a generation ago? What compels you to care about it um, enough to join us in this discussion of the river's history tonight? I'm guessing it's because in the last couple of decades, we've come to understand the Duwamish River as a reflection of ourselves, which Maybe, but why does it matter to you? Duwamish tribal member James Rasmussen, who's a central figure in this book, once answered that question by saying, that's like asking me why my grandmother matters. Our family shapes us and our places mold us. So our river tells us something about who we are. The Duwamish River is a living reflection of Seattle's history. It's central to the character of our city, and it tells us a lot about who we are and who we have been. After spending a couple of decades getting to know this river and the resiliency of both its ecosystems and its people, um, I think the story of the Duwamish also shows us a lot about who and what we can be. So I'm guessing that's why we're all here today. I'd like to start off by sharing with you all an excerpt from the book about a meeting between two families who are present with me here tonight. In the fall of 1865, Mary Ann Cavanaugh began making plans for a winter feast at her family's homestead on the Duwamish River. The days were shortening and in the past few years, that had taught her to anticipate the isolation and loneliness of pioneer winters in the Northwest. She and her family drew up a guest list, commandeered post carriers and canoes to deliver the invitations and foraged for blackberries and Oregon grape near the river. 
When the fall floods swamped the valley, her family and neighbors harvested potatoes and flesh ducks from the reeds. And as winter approached, they hunted for venison and bear. On the morning of January 16th, 1866, Mary Ann rose early and began making her final pre preparations. Her family had settled on the Duwamish River in September 1851. The US government's promise of 160 free acres to every settler who put down roots and improved the land had drawn her father and brother north from the California gold fields. Their land claims were the first in this part of the Oregon Territory, just upriver from a deep embayment in Puget Sound. Mary Ann's father, Jacob Maple, and her brother Samuel had been persuaded to survey for land along the river by the Nisqually settler, Luther Collins, whom they met when the three were returning from the gold fields. When they arrived, the river delta and tidal estuary snaking south hosted 15 longhouses dispersed among five villages. In the network of rivers and lakes making up the larger watershed, at least 90 longhouses housed an estimated 10,000 native people. Collins' original land claim was about 50 miles south of the Duwamish Valley, and he'd visited the Fertile River Basin before. He knew that white settlers could anticipate the support of a local native leader, Sialf, who had been recruiting pioneers unsuccessfully to date to settle in his territory and form alliances. Self had provided them with a team of native, native guides for a scouting visit in June 1851. Now, nearly 15 years later, Self was expected as a prominent and honored guest at the Maple Cavanaugh clan's winter feast. Most of the guests were already present when Self arrived at the party. Rounding the river bend in a massive canoe propelled by 50 paddlers, his entourage slapped the water and sang a traditional welcome song as they approached. As Self came ashore, Mary Ann recalled the chief stepping from his canoe with all the dignity of his rank and formally greeted the assembled settlers. His retinue then unloaded gifts of cougar skins, moccasins, fish, and salmon roe, an expression of Self's friendship as well as his status and wealth. The bill of fare for the feast reflected the panoply of wild foods introduced to the pioneers by Self's people. Clam chowder, stewed clams, smoked, boiled and fried salmon, grouse, duck, quail, snipe, venison, smoked bear, mashed potatoes, roasted squash, honey and comb, preserved wild blackberries and Oregon grape jam. The guests were seated on makeshift benches the family had built from cedar boards and tucked into every available corner. And dinner was followed by toasts and stories that extended late into the night. Many of the settlers' tales of their earliest years together acknowledged the tremendous help they had received from South. But they also recounted the many clashes they had with hostile members of his and other nearby tribes. It was the last time South would visit the settlers in the city they had named for him. Six months later, he passed away at his home on the Suquamish tribe's Port Madison Indian Reservation, the location of his family's expansive longhouse, Old Man House. Port Madison on the Kitsap Peninsula across Puget Sound was the only land reserved for South's people following the treaty that he had been persuaded or obliged to sign by the territory's colonial governor a decade earlier. No reservation had been created within his maternal Duwamish family's ancestral lands, where Marianne and her family lived, and no newspaper reported his passing. We rarely hear these kinds of stories about South, and almost never about the generations that came before him. But history didn't begin when Captain Vancouver sailed into Puget Sound, or when white settlers claimed land here. South's father, Schwabe, paddled up the Duwamish River in the 1780s to a village called Stuck to marry his bride, Sholitsa. According to their descendants, the couple gave birth to their son, Self, on Blake Island in 1786. Seven generations later, we were fortunate to have his great-great-great-great-grandson, Ken Workman, here with us tonight. Before we introduce him, I'd like to read one more excerpt about Ken and his relationship with our river and his vision for the river's future.
EPA's project manager, Allison Hiltner, explained the details of the agency's proposed river cleanup plan at a public meeting at South Seattle College in April 2013. When the floor was opened for public testimony, Ken Workman, the four times great grandson of Chief South, began to speak. Alternating between English and the Lushootseed language, he welcomed the attendees to his family's traditional land. He spoke about participating in the University of Washington's health impact assessment on behalf of the Duwamish tribe and about being taught by his father not to eat certain fish from the river because of the cancer in them. Workman is not what many people in Seattle envision when they think of native people. A passionate motocross racer and a Boeing company analyst, Workman began to teach himself Lashitsit at the age of 56. He grew up knowing his family's Duwamish heritage, but he discovered that he was a direct descendant of South only when he was in his 50s. For him, being Duwamish meant he was imprinted on the land around the river. I was born and raised in West Seattle, on the beach of Alki and in the woods along the West Bank Duwamish River, Workman later said. The trees called, I played in the woods and swam in the river, and this is all I know. Rivers draw my family. At the meeting, Workman had a direct request for EPA. I would ask that we be able to use the river, to walk on those beaches, to drop a line in the water and pull up a bottom fish, a bottom fish, and throw it on the fire and cook it without fear. I would encourage that when we clean up the Duwamish River, that we do it right. We do it for the long term. Workman's statement marked the first time EPA had received public testimony in a Coast Salish language. As the deadline for a cleanup decision approached, Native and immigrant community leaders, fishermen, business owners, longshoremen, environmental and neighborhood organizations, artists, media personalities, and even the hip hop icon Macklemore lent their voices to a River for All campaign that sought to strengthen the final plan and protect the health of the river's most exposed and vulnerable constituents. By the time the public comment period on the plan was over, EPA had received more than 2,300 comments on its proposal in 10 languages. The Duwamish River cleanup would affect the health and well being of dozens of racial, ethnic, and linguistic communities. The most acutely affected would be people whose health for economic or cultural reasons, was inextricably linked to the health of the river's fish. These communities, traditionally the most marginalized in highly stratified Seattle, had become the driving force behind the Duwamish cleanup. It's been um, a real honor for me to be given the gift and the opportunity of seeing the river through the eyes of people like Ken Workman. And while I've spent most of my waking hours for the past 25 years um, at the river, I've developed my own relationship, albeit much shallower, um, with it. And for those of you who've spent time there, I'm sure you too have developed your relationships and have your own stories to tell. And some of those stories are in this book. Um, but I'm going to switch gears now before we introduce our guests. And if you give me just a moment to share my screen. go. Hopefully that's working for you. I'm going to begin with a map of the Duwamish watershed in the 1800s. Um, for orientation, you can just barely see the word, but right here is downtown Seattle on Elliott Bay. Behind it, Lake Washington and then Lake Sammamish. The rest of the Duwamish watershed is to the south of Seattle. And it includes the White River, which actually begins a little bit off screen down here um, up on Mount Rainier, the Green River and the Cedar. The White River flows from Mount Rainier down to the town that was uh, called Slaughter in the 1800s, now known as Auburn, where it was met by the Green River, which came down from Stampede Pass. 
And after being joined by the green, the white continued all the way down to its junction with the Black River. The Black River is very small. It just covers this short segment here, but it drains the entire Cedar River watershed and Lake Sammamish, the Sammamish River, Lake Washington and all of its drainage, including Green Lake here, which used to drain through Ravenna Creek. And then all of that together flew out, sorry, flowed out of the south end of Lake Washington, joined the Cedar through the Black. And from that point down, those combined rivers were called the Duwamish or Duwamps River, which drained into what was then Duwamps Bay. Today, this looks very different. The White River, where it came down to meet the green, was diverted by a group of farmers in 1898 with dynamite. Let's see, having a little trouble with my pen. There we go. Um, so that it was diverted down the Stuck River Valley into the Puyallup and out to Puget Sound through Commencement Bay. That diversion to avoid flooding was then made permanent with the help of armed guards after heavy flooding in 1906. And after that date, it was permanently diverted away from the Duwamish River Valley and to Tacoma instead. At that point, where the green once met the Duwamish, it was only the green and the headwaters from Stampede Pass that continued on. As the old White River continued down to its junction with the Black, the Black, we remember, drains the Cedar and Lake Washington. In 1912, a small diversion to avoid flooding in the town of Renton that had built up here um, brought the Cedar River directly into Lake Washington, ultimately to flow back on the other side of Renton into the Black again until 1916. The largest change to the watershed came from a very small cut between Lake Washington and Portage Bay on Lake Union and a slightly, slightly larger, longer, but a narrow cut widening a stream from Lake Union to Shoal Shoal Bay. That dropped the river level, excuse me, the um, lake level in Lake Washington by at least seven feet and cut off its connection to the Black River, which from that date on no longer connected the Cedar and the lakes to the Duwamish, leaving just the green Duwamish River as the sole source for the watershed. At the same time, beginning actually in 1895, the open bay at the end of the Duwamish began to be transformed as well. In the early years of building out industrial corridors and rail lines, colonizers began to use the tidal mudflats to suspend elevated rail lines across the bay and also to build little factory islands like this one here. The mudflats at that time were considered worthless and even pestilent by the early industrialists. Um, one of these by the name of Eugene Semple created Harbor Island and its flanking waterways. And he boasted about his work by writing, on this land will be founded the major portion of the manufacturing industries of the city by making solid and substantial land where formerly there was water, the rising and falling of the tides, and occasionally bare and unsightly mudflats which were a menace to the health of the dwellers on the adjacent dry lands. Semple delivered on his promise. Today's Soto, Harbor Island, and West Seattle's marine terminals are a testament to his vision. From the original meandering course of the Duwamish River below the historic Black River Junction, the tide flats were followed by a plan to straighten the entire Duwamish River and fill in its old river meanders in order to expand industry to the south of Seattle. We're gonna focus on this area right here. Today, the original 12 miles of the lower Duwamish River has been channelized into a short five mile shipping canal, but for a brief period, the straightened waterway and the original river meanders coexisted. That was short-lived, however. There's today one remaining natural river bend, and the story about how that came to be is also in the book, that used to be part 
of those unsightly mud flats and open water at the mouth of the river. Now it's a mile upriver. You can see it here and again here. Full mile upriver of the constructed end of the shipping canal and the surrounding built up industrial lands. And here's that river bend. To put the contemporary Duwamish River in perspective, I'm going to give you a little virtual tour of one of the original historic reaches of the Duwamish watershed, if I can get this to work. And my apologies in advance. Um, Google Maps is still a little shaky, but I'm hoping this will run well for us. We're going to begin at the origins of the White River at Mount Rainier. Okay, Emmons Glacier is the source of the White River and runs under an avalanche that covered the bottom of the glacier in the 1950s. At the bottom of that avalanche, an ice cave is the source of the contemporary White River. And once again, this is in fact jamming up on me a little bit. Let's see if I can get it back for you. And if it freezes up a second time, we'll skip this section. But it's a lot of fun to be able to see this whole thing. Okay, so again, Emmons Glacier flowing under the old rock avalanche down to the ice caves. Here we go, where you can actually visit Mount Rainier today and see this for yourself. At the end of the, at the mouth of the ice caves, you can see the White River flowing out from the bottom of Emmons Glacier. And you can follow it around the mountain, there it is, down to the town of Greenwater, where it's joined by the Greenwater River flowing down from Natchez Pass up this way. Natchez Pass itself was one of the old wagon trails that some of the first settlers used to come over into the Oregon Territory. Following the white past Enumclaw to Auburn, we come to the place where the White River was diverted south rather than flowing north as it used to, to Seattle. The diversion now goes south to the Puyallup and Tacoma. But on the other side of Auburn, the old Green River Junction, the Green River still flows through. It just simply doesn't connect with the White anymore. Below this point, long after the White was diverted, the river retained the name White River as it always had. And over only over time, did the name change to the Green. We even pass through the Green River through the historic town of White River reflecting that history as we flow towards its, uh, black, its junction with the Black River. At the Black River Junction, once upon a time, the entire drainage of the Cedar River and Lake Sammamish and Washington joined the White River at this point. Today, it just drains some wetlands and occasionally the overflow from the Renton sewage treatment plant before now the Duwamish River continues to flow down to the beginning of the constructed ship canal. The straightened Duwamish waterway begins at turning basin number three in Tukwila, just before entering the Seattle city limits. We go past some of the early industrial areas, including Georgetown and here, Boeing's Plant 2, where 16 B-17 bombers were built each day during World War II. Right across the river, the old town, now neighborhood of South Park. And as we continue down, we come to Georgetown on the other side of the river, where the very first settlers to this area put down their land claims, Luther Collins, the Maple family, and Henry Van Asselt. Today, that area is mostly industrial Georgetown. And as we continue down the river from there, we come to that one last remaining village, bend, a village on the river bend. This is the historical village site of Uliquat, which is responsible for the fact that we still have this river bend at all. And then everything downriver from that is constructed land built on the open bay and those old tide flats, including Harbor Island, which at the time it was built was the largest man-made island in the world. Only when we come out of the other side of those constructed lands do we find ourselves in the downtown Seattle waterfront, 
where Pioneer Square and part of downtown itself is part of that fill. Okay. At the same time that those changes were happening, there were also really dramatic changes taking place among the rivers people. White colonial settlement turned the waterfront, the watershed social landscape just upside down. Um, and I wanna introduce you to one of the families who kept meticulous records of what happened to them in the seven generations that have passed since white settlement. A couple of decades before the first settler put down roots in the current city of Seattle, when the Maples, Collins, and Van Asselt families claimed their land on the banks of the Duwamish River, which was before the arrival of the Denny party, this man, Sebald, and his sister, Tuptaliut, was were born to a Black River family in the village of Sababadid. They were highborn, or among the leadership class of the region's indigenous people. Sadal became a healer. His sister married Chris Canem, a Skagit chief from Whitby Island, who was an ally of Chief Self, and signed the Treaty of Point Elliot alongside him. He and Tuptaliut had two daughters, and Sebald, became known as Dr. Jack or Uncle Jack to his family. Canem and Tukdalyut's daughter, Kiolitsa, get my laser going, there we go, moved back. She moved back to her mother's ancestral village of Sababadid on the Black River, just as white pioneers were beginning to settle in these homelands. Her family's oral history says she was kidnapped by the Yakima Nation and later escaped using a canoe and paddle that she stole in order to make her way back home. She then married a white pioneer, Dr. Reuben Bigelow, who opened the region's first coal mine. And after he died, she married another settler to whom she, with whom she and her family eventually moved to Vashon Island. Their first daughter, Nellie, was among Puget Sound area's first generation of mixed native settler children. As a teenager, she returned to the Seattle area and wound up working in the home of Judge Thomas Burke, who was an attorney and a railroad booster, whose name is memorialized today in the Burke Building downtown and the Burke Gilman Trail. It seems that Nellie learned a great deal about the law and specifically about land transactions from Burke and may have helped her Uncle Jack secure a homestead land claim in the 1890s on the Cedar River the only such claim ever granted to a Duwamish person in their native homelands. Nellie married a white immigrant as well, with whom she had a son, Myron Overacker Jr., who was named after his father. And after she negotiated a series of land deals, um, her entire Duwamish family was reunited back together in their natal watershed. Nellie and her husband then homesteaded on state-owned land on top of Beacon Hill overlooking Lake Washington. Myron Jr. was a child when the Duwamish River was being straightened, when the lake level dropped, when the tidelands in Elliott Bay um, were turned into Seattle's industrial powerhouse. He wound up working in one of Harbor Island's first industries, then called Todd Shipyards, now Vigor. He was also a founding member of the new Duwamish Tribal Council, organized under the governing US laws that were required at the time in order to carry on their tribal governance. By the time Myron Jr.'s daughter Anne was born, the Duwamish watershed's transformation was complete, and the population of Seattle had exploded and diversified. She grew up during World War II and remembered their Beacon Hill neighbor, Tadashi Yamaguchi, being taken away in 1941 and interred along with the rest of his Japanese family. She raised her own son in the same house her grandparents had homesteaded and followed her father in serving on the Duwamish Tribal Council. In the photo here, she's holding the canoe paddle that Kiolitsa used to escape her abduction by the Yakimas. Anne's son, Chris Canem and Tuptaliut's great-great-great-grandson, James Rasmussen, was born in 1955. Reading a description of him as a young man, taken from the book, six feet tall, James carried himself with pride. His brown hair pulled back in a long ponytail and he sported a thick beard. He was a notable musician in Seattle's jazz scene. And at age 24, 
was following in the footsteps of his mother and grandfather on the Duwamish Tribal Council. We're gonna come back to James and his relationship with the river in a minute. James's niece, his sister's daughter, Christine Nelson, is the seventh generation since Dr. Jack and his sister greeted the first white settlers to Puget Sound. She's the fourth generation of his family to serve on the modern Duwamish Tribal Council. The changes this family has witnessed on the Duwamish watershed and in this region are documented in the river that made Seattle. And the family's adaptation and resilience are really astounding but they're not alone. Other descendants of Chris Canem and descendants of Chief Sielf and many others are still with us, as are the descendants of the first settler families. Many of them are actively influencing the future of the city of Seattle to this day. This is certainly true of James. Just as his ancestors did, James has a way of forging alliances with people who are quite different from himself. Um, and I'd like to tell you briefly about one of them. In 1984, James met John Beale. John was a Vietnam War veteran who moved to the Duwamish Valley in 1976. He suffered from PTSD and at age 29, he had three heart attacks and was diagnosed as terminal with maybe six months to live. His doctors recommended that he find a hobby he enjoyed and to make peace with his fate. John turned to the little semblance of nature he could find in a deep ravine behind his house with a murky stream and thick blackberry brambles and lots of trash. But grateful for the quiet refuge it offered him, he resolved he was going to clean it up. He wanted to leave that little patch of nature better than he had found it. He succeeded and much of his story has now been told all around the world. He also survived for another 30 years. The part of the story that's much less known is the relationship between James and John. In 1984, John Beale approached the Duwamish tribe to ask for their help restoring salmon runs in the Duwamish River and its little tributary, his creek, Ham Creek, in South Park. As the council heard him out, James was particularly impressed with John's passion for the river. The two formed a partnership that would transform both the creek and the Duwamish River over the next two decades. They worked together to focus attention on the river that had sustained James's family for generations and the creek that John credited with keeping him alive. In 1990, they gained the support of the city of Seattle and King County to launch a public-private partnership called the Green Duwamish Watershed Alliance. And then in 2000, they recruited a broad-based coalition of native, environmental, social justice, and neighborhood groups to create the Duwamish River Cleanup Coalition. By the time EPA listed the river for Superfund cleanup in 2001, James and John were poised and ready to lead the charge for a river revival that would protect the health of all of the river's native and immigrant constituents. The rest, as they say, is history. In the years since, the river has been transformed from the dumping ground I found in 1994 to a place where thousands of volunteers have restored riverfront habitat that had long since been destroyed. And the watershed's native people have been undertaking a cultural revitalization of their river traditions, their resource uses, and their political leadership in the Seattle area. Over the years, they've been joined in their efforts by new waves of immigrants by fishing families, longshoremen, recreational river users, and countless numbers of residents living in the river's historic waterfront neighborhoods of South Park and Georgetown and Riverside. Many of these new immigrants and neighbors are now taking up the mantle of leadership for the river cleanup themselves. Paulina Lopez, pictured here, is a human rights law expert originally from Ecuador who chose to live in the South Park neighborhood because of its proximity to the river. She's recently become the newest director of the Duwamish River Cleanup Coalition and says her focus is centered on the next generation. The wealth of Seattle was built on the back of the Duwamish River, she said recently. Sometimes I feel like we're being crushed, but then I wake up in the morning and I see our youth how much potential they have. When she sees that, she says, I feel like we're building a movement. 
I think the folks that can best give you some perspective on the human dimensions of the past, present, and future of the watershed are those folks whose stories are partly told in the pages of the river that made Seattle. So without any further delay, um, I'd like to introduce or bring back uh, Grace Rajendran from UW Bookstore to move us into the next portion of our program. Thank you for a wonderful presentation, BJ. And now I would like to introduce author and historian Jennifer Ott, who will be moderating the panel discussion. Jennifer Ott is an environmental historian, assistant director of History Link, an editor of Seattle at 150, stories of the city through 150 objects from the Seattle Municipal Archives, author of Olmsted in Seattle, creating a park system for a modern city, and co-author with David B. Williams of Waterway, the story of Seattle's locks and ship canal. She is a contributor of Washington State History to HistoryLink.org, Seattle Magazine, and Oregon Historical Quarterly. And now let's move to our panel discussion, moderated by Jennifer Ott. Rookie mistake, I forgot to set my unmute on. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here um, and be part of this program tonight. I just can't get enough of the Duwamish River history and that was fascinating, BJ. Um, as an environmental historian, um, I've been long interested in how people live and work on the river and their relationship with it. Um, it it's just such an interesting place to have at the center of the story that we are talking about. And I'm really excited that BJ has written a book um, that will draw attention to the story of the river and the role it's played in the region's history because um, as I'm sure even some people watching now, it's just a really eye-opening when you realize the depth and the length of the human history related to this river and um, how important it's been in the history of the region. And so I am very happy to be moderating the discussion. And this is my first time doing it on Zoom, so bear with me. I don't yet see Ken, um, but I'm gonna go ahead and introduce Louise, who is on the screen. And uh, while we wait for Ken, Louise is a, Louise Jones Brown is a sixth generation descendant of, oh yay, there's Ken, hello. Um, Louise Jones Brown is a sixth generation descendant of pioneer settler Jacob Maple, Maple who arrived on the banks of the Duwamish River on June 22nd, 1851 to scout locations with, for their, um, sorry, with his son Samuel and Luther Collins. And um, the party was invited by Chief Seattle to scout out locations for their Oregon donation land claims. And she is currently a member of the Pioneer Association of Seattle, Daughters of the Pioneers, Chapter One, and uh, Tukwila Historical Society. So thank you for being here, Louise. And um, Ken Workman, who joined us, is um, a retired systems and data analyst from Boeing's Flight Operations Engineering Department. And he has served on the Duwamish Tribal Council and is president of the Duwamish Tribal, Site, um, Tribal Services 501c3. Um, Ken is a member of the Duwamish Tribe and the, the First People of Seattle. And today, Ken enjoys a retired life living on a river in the mountains of east of Seattle. And so um, I have a few questions for each of you. Thank you, Ken, too, for being here. And um, we'll move through them. And I encourage if anybody wants to comment on each other's um, comments, uh, please do that. The conversation is very fun. And so I'm gonna start with BJ. Um, how did you come to know the river and get involved in cleanup efforts? Thank you, Jennifer. Really a pleasure to have you here for this interview. Thanks so much for, for being here. Um, well, I do, I do tell the story a little bit, but um, I'll, I'll summarize. Uh, when I first moved to Seattle um, permanently, I had family from here and I used to spend my summers here. But although my mother was born and raised here, um, she moved to New York. So I'm, I'm a New Yorker. <laughs> But uh, I've been back in Seattle, uh, with my, reunited with my family since 1994. And the very first job that I took when I came here was as a volunteer manager and trainer for an organization called Puget Soundkeeper Alliance. And my first job involved um, training kayakers to monitor for pollution 
in order to clean up Puget Sound. So we had kind of a citizen's navy of sorts um, that would go out and identify the things that were fouling Puget Sound so that we could come up with strategies to clean them up. Um, and one of our training grounds was the Duwamish River. So I was introduced to it once and then started bringing volunteers and kayaks out and taking notes and taking samples. And um, for the last, what is that, 26 years, it just, it just stole my heart and the amazing diversity of wildlife and birds and people in the middle of this industrial waterway was, was just astounding. So um, sparked my imagination and has held on to me ever since. <laughs> It's such a different perspective to be on the water, on the river, and looking up into the city and around you. I, I'm always amazed by what, how that changes your perception of the river, or my perception of the river. So shifting to Ken, and Ken, I see you still got your audio muted if you want to unmute that. There you go. Um, do you remember the first time you fished or boated or swam in the river? I do. Um, the first time I swam in the river was around 1959, 1960. And it would be on the west bank at the mouth of the river, just south of the old um, Lockheed shipyards. Oh, yeah. Because there used to be a sandy beach there before the, it was all that T5 asphalt thing we see today. Wow. And so while my mother didn't know how to swim, she took my brother and I down there to that sandy beach and she just threw us in <laughs> to figure it out. Did you figure it out? Clearly you're oh, still yeah. alive. You yeah, did. Dog, dog paddle. <laughs> Got a couple of little kids out there just doing the dog paddle out there in the water. Drive by fire. <laughs> but, uh, that's, and so it was wonderful times. It was well, with a, a big grassy field down there and a sandy beach and... And that's my first memories of being tossed in the Duwamish River. So that's really remarkable. Within your lifetime, it's still being tremendously transformed. It's not just that a century ago it was transformed. Within our lifetimes, there's been massive transformation on the river. Yes, and it's, and it's still happening. Yeah, and it's really so interesting. It, it is. And so now when I go down to the Jack Block Park, I always make sure I go up onto that tall tower and I look east to look for that little sandy beach because that just brings back the memories. And I go, that's where I learned to swim, right over there. Oh, wow. Uh, and beyond that sort of very immersive experience, how, what role has the river played in your life? Well, it's played a big role. Um, as a Duwamish person, um, I've always known that this is who I was, a Duwamish tribal member. And so what's a Duwamish tribe? Well, they're the people of this river. And the river meanders around and it, it kind of goes up from Elliott Bay and then way up into the hills where it turns into the green. And then in Renton where there's the black and all of that stuff. So it was right on the lower section that I grew up and it was when you come down off of what we always called Boeing Hill, mm -hmm. which is at the southern part of uh, Pigeon Point. We'd go down there to that, uh, is it First Avenue Bridge? And just yep. underneath of it, that's, that's the boat launch. Um, so that's where you put your boat in. So eventually, uh, Dad, he had his boat moored at one of those little mooring places down there where the longhouse is right now. Mm -hmm. Right by the park. Yeah, there used to be a, a small little um, uh, marina. Hmm. And so we jump in dad's boat right there and head down the river and out into the bay and fishing and camping. And so the rivers played, you know, a, a role in our life just by being the river. And of course, it's, an, it's our identity. Right, sense of place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so Louise, did you grow up near the river? Well, actually, probably, I'm going to say when I was seven or eight, we stayed mostly on the side of the mountains. I'm actually uh, more of a Colville, Kettle Falls person. How interesting. So I was raised 
on the rivers fishing as a young child. But my family started boating probably in the early 60s from a um, marina that was not far from where Ken was just talking about. Wow. And wow. We would go, you know, we were out on the, on the bay all the time. Now, this is 30 years before I learn about my pioneer ancestors. And even mm -hmm. after that boating, my family, we had boats. We took my children out. We were always launching at Alki Point, mm -hmm. you know, going through the bay, down the river, up the river. Uh, I had no clue that Boeing Field or any of that information had anything to do with my ancestry. And I found out 1994 that I had an aunt that I had never met. Uh -huh. And she introduced me to the family heritage because she knew most of it. She didn't know all of it. But uh, it changed my perspective once I started learning the historical part and learning about the relationship that my family had with the Duwamish and their influence on my family's decision to even settle in this area because they were farmers in Iowa. They already had land back there, but the opportunities were a bit too much for them to pass up. So you two are like the perfect case studies of why you should know your family's history. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I wonder how many other people have long roots in this region that aren't aware of it. My family are very recent arrivals, my grandparents' generation, but, um, I wonder how many people have long histories in this region and interconnected stories like your family does. Um, so I was wondering if you all, whoever would like to go first, would like to share a story about the river that you think illustrates something important about it. And um, I'll just give a quick example. About 10 years ago, I attended my first Duwamish Alive event and I went from having a very intellectual document-based understanding of the river to after that event, I understood the community and the people experiences on the river, and which is a problem sometimes as historians have, is that we get too caught up in the documents from the past and forget that there's people today that still have very deep connections to these places. And so I was, ever since then, I, I just really, it's open, it opened my eyes to understanding that it's not just industry and transportation, that it's people and communities that are on the river. So do you have a story like that that you could share, anybody? Well, I could jump into this if you'd like, because I didn't really have an interaction with the Duwamish people, even in that first 10 years when I found out there were stories that matched my family to theirs. I was at a Pioneer Association picnic meeting and I met Amy Johnson, who is a David descent, Denny descendant, and she invited me to join her group who was forming an alliance with the Duwamish and uh, starting to fundraise for the Longhouse. It actually really changed my life. The relationships that I was able to develop with the Duwamish will live with me for the rest of my life. That's amazing, yeah. And Ken or BJ? Uh, sure. Um, the Duwamish River has been a transportation source for us forever and ever. Um, it's like an interstate highway. So that's how you get around. But it's also a food source. So f commercially, from the native perspective, this is where you had to be, was on this waterway. And so then when Grandpa said, you know, which, which means come ashore, my friends, quihi. Uh, you're welcome here. Then everything changed, and yet the river turned into an industrial source for modern people. And so it continued to serve a purpose. And so today we're watching it, the river get cleaned up. So even today, it's going through a phase three, where it first was a pristine, and then it got kind of messed up. And now uh, people uh, are starting to clean it up. So society is beginning to change. And so this is an important thing. It's sort of like a mirror on society. <laughs> it is. You can trace uh, some important changes in how people understand their place in the landscape just by looking at the history of the river. Yeah. How about you, BJ? Before I 
do. Um, I, I'm kind of loath to let go of, of this discussion with Ken oh, and Louise. Can I may just ask a quick follow up? Um, oh, sure. So, you know, Ken, your ancestor welcomed the Maple family, Louise's family, to this river. The Maple family, 15 years later, welcomed Ken to the space they'd carved out for that feast that we that we read about earlier. Um, and I'm curious when the two of you first met. <laughs> and, and what did you say to each other? <laughs> Well, I can jump into that because we were actually participants in a uh, web uh, seminar at the White River Museum. To that point, we had not met each other. And he was sitting there just innocently <laughs> saving his face at the table. So I walked to him and asked him if uh, the seat was taken. Then we introduced ourselves and we could not believe the happen chance of that meeting because that, that just was like serendipitous. Yeah, this stuff happens all the time. So eventually you just say, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then of course, Louise helps the, uh, helped us out at the longhouse a whole lot on canoe journeys and stuff. Oh, yeah. Do you want to explain what canoe journey is just briefly? I, it's just such an amazing thing that if anyone who's watching doesn't know, we want to make sure they do. Sure. It's, do you want me to do that, BJ, or do you want to? Oh, gosh, no, please. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, it's canoe journey is an annual event out here in the Northwest, and it involves uh, invitations to virtually anybody and everybody to arrive at a destination that is hosted by a local tribe. Uh, sometimes the local tribe is 400 miles up into Canada and sometimes it's clear down on the other end of uh, Puget Sound or out there on the ocean. But there's always the destination and there's the date. And invitations go out and maps are then drawn up on how to get to these places in a canoe. So you're out on the water paddling in these 35 footers and these 40 footers and you know they've got crews of 10, 11, 15, 8 and you're always eventually going to end up at the host. But you only can go about 30 miles a day when you're pulling, when you're actually paddling in these canoes. And so these stops along the way are all carefully coordinated with other host, tribes, families, and you then share culture, which includes stories and songs and uh, respect. And so this is how we communicate. And so you can speak a foreign language, but in a lot of our songs, they're just vocable. So there's they're the thing like the o e o kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And in this way, you can share who you are as a people with people completely foreign to you. So it's a lot of fun, especially when you're on the water because when the seals pop up and they go, what's that strange thing moving through the water with all of these paddles that are dipping going down at the same time and out at the same time. Wow. It's very exciting. It is, it's, uh, the energy of it is amazing when you see it, yeah, so great. Um, Oh, I got caught up in the conversation and didn't keep track of my questions. Just one second. Um, do you want to add a story, BJ, or should I move on? Um, I, I can. I'll tell a, a really different kind of story just for diversity's sake, I guess. Um, there's so many stories that, I mean, there's, there's these incredible, you know, historical connections. Um, and those are really uh, optimistic to me in a way. But um, there's also a lot of stories that really exemplify the injustice, right, of how all of the river's peoples through these seven generations um, have been treated. Um, but <laughs> while there's plenty of those, I think I'm gonna talk instead about something more positive that's really very recent. Um, so much of the fight about cleaning up this river, um, you know, how much to clean up, how much is it gonna cost, all of that, so much of that was framed when it was happening as a fight between industry and environmentalists. 
um, which was really in many ways a false dichotomy. Um, people like to see things in simple contrasts, um, but this mm -hmm. river is anything but simple. Um, unfortunately, though, that led a lot of folks to kind of dig in um, and insist that, you know, either this is an industrial river, you know, and it's unreasonable to expect to fish here, or uh, this river needs to be returned to its pristine state, um, you know, and, and everything else has to go away. Um, and, you know, most people didn't hold either of those extremes, but they were out there. Um, you know, neither of those are really reasonable propositions. Um, people have a right to fish here. And this river will never be the same as it was before the 1800s. Nothing is, everything changes, um, including the Duwamish. And this, that doesn't have to be a bad thing. Um, but the important story that I was thinking of comes after EPA made its final decision about the river cleanup and the cleanup actually got underway. Um, they needed a place to put all the waste. You know, to clean up a river, we have to remove a lot of toxic contaminated sediment, mud from the bottom of the river. Um, and they needed to get it out and figure out, you know, where it was going to go. And suddenly there was an opportunity for local industries to benefit from the cleanup. Um, one of these is a company called Lafarge Cement. Um, it was struggling at that time, as many of the, the river's industries were, to stay afloat. Um, but they realized that they had a facility that could actually um, collect all of that contaminated mud that was coming out of the river. They could process it, they could dry it, and they could, they had the facility offloading and the transport facilities to then ship it to safe landfills. Um, and suddenly they were rehiring crew members who they previously laid off. They added a third shift um, at their plant and rescued a business that was in decline because of the river cleanup. They were a responsible party. They have some price to pay for the cleanup, but they've managed to reinvigorate their business, reinvent their business and benefit from the cleanup and kind of just, just destroy that false dichotomy. Um, studies actually indicate that there's thousands of jobs, millions of dollars um, to be made cleaning up the Duwamish and we have to be really careful not to fall into those traps of simplifying what's going on here. Because um, I think really everybody, no matter what perspective, no matter what history they're coming at this from, they all want the same thing, right? Everybody wants to be whole and to be healthy at the end of this. Um, and I think that's a really important lesson for us going forward, the kind of experience that, that Lafarge had. Right, to not let the fear prevent good things from happening. Yeah. yeah, cool. Okay. Um, the next question I have for Ken, um, how does it feel for you, to you, for us to be gathering in 2020 to talk about human relationships centered around the river? Well, I kind of like it. It sort <laughs> of feels like everybody coming home. Yep. And so when it became industrialized and everything changed and everybody got pushed out, um, then it was just an industrial corridor. It was rechanneled, and it really wasn't a people place. And so now that it's being restored, it's turning back into a people place as well as industry. You can still have all of that, but it feels like everybody's coming home. And so it gives me great hope. Um, the river, what a, I was looking at my notes just now because I wrote down the word artery. Mm -hmm. The river is like a human artery and it was once pristine and then it got all plugged up. And so now the doctors have gone in. Thank you, BJ. <laughs> <laughs> and they've cleaned out those vessels. And so now it's beginning to flow once again. And so just like me, when I was young, I was fine. And then I got older and I got plugged up. I saw the doctor and he said, here, we're gonna fix you up. So here I am as a human being, mimicking the cycle of the Duwamish River over a hundred years. So yeah, I, I have a, a whole lot of hope and it feels like people are coming home. The animals are coming home. And so the West Bank of the Duwamish, the entire um, Greenbelt right there, Puget Park, it's starting to come back to life. 
the uh, heron are coming back, the eagles are coming back. Uh, James describes seals coming back. And I've seen the seals in the river. So it's coming back alive. It gives me great hope, this cleanup. It is interesting that you bring that up too, that that relationship, not just the waterway, but it ripples out into the landscape. And that's such an important part, I think, of thinking about rivers and how they're all interconnected with the landscape around them. Yeah. So um, Louise, how did learning about your connection to the Maple family change your perception of the river or Seattle more generally? Wow. Uh, standing on the banks of the river down by the Tukwila Community Center, being out on Elliott Bay or near the mouth of the river, I can now actually almost visually see my ancestors in those Duwamish canoes. I mean, it, it just, it's kind of spooky, actually, because I can picture it. I mean, like Ken said, it was the highway. That was how they got in and out. That They had to go to uh, the far, far reaches of the south part of the Puget Sound in order to get supplies. There were no grocery stores here. Mm -hmm. If they needed, you know, mm -hmm. provisions, they had to make that canoe journey and then get all the way down to Nisqually in order to get supplies. So until they actually opened up the stores and had ships bringing in supplies, the river was the artery. Elliott Bay was, you know, the push-off point to go around Alki and down the Tacoma Narrows. I can't even imagine because I've seen some of those canoe journeys, and I know that that's a very harrowing experience when the weather decides to pick up around here. And it, it does, does as a boat I know. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, so the perspective of knowing that my ancestors were here, that the Duwamish were part of the fiber of their life here, it, it, it's made such a connection for me to be able to be involved with the Duwamish, be involved with that river at all. It, it just brings back all of those fibers that are in your genetics. You can't avoid it. It's there. Yeah. It's interesting too, because we, we talk about the river as a transportation route for goods and that sort of thing, but it also, and Ken, correct me if I'm not characterizing this correctly, but it's also about connections between people and that sort of upriver, downriver, and then up and down the sound relationships and how all the communities were interconnected. And it's the same thing for the non-native settlers that came here, that they would be going to Olympia to get familiar items like flour maybe, but they would also be going to visit um, people that they knew. And so I always, I think of how different the rhythm of my life would be if my relationships were dependent on moving by water. It would be such a different way of living in this place um, than, you know, hopping on I-5 and hoping for the best. <laughs> so, yeah, would you, is that a good characterization? Well, well, it kind of is, and maybe a little bit not. <clears throat> because the water is the easy way to go. And so from an engineering perspective, you never want to do the hard thing first or the difficult thing first. <laughs> and so rivers always take the easy way. And so it might be a little bit longer, but it requires less energy. And so therefore, just jump in your Kelby. Um, Kelby is a generic term for transportation device, um, Lachutzi language. Uh -huh. You just jump in that, hop on the water, and away you go. And you ride the tides. Yeah. So the Duwamish River, the tide effect goes up about 12 miles today, clear up past South Park, or not South Park, uh, South Center. Yeah. Uh, past Renton. And so all you have to do is when the tide is coming in, jump in your canoe and sit there. And it will take you all the way up. And then when it's going out, just sit there. And I can, I can testify to this because we've done it at, um, at South Park's, um, the, this festival you were describing. Mm -hmm. Duwamish Alive. Duwamish Alive. At the end of the day, when it's time to close down and the canoes leave, the tide's going out. You just let the tide take you out. You don't even have to work at it. 
So, I have never thought about it on the upstream side. I've always thought of that more on the open sound that, you know, it's easier to move around if you go with the tides. I've never thought about going upriver with the tide. That would be amazing. Makes total oh. sense. Yeah. 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 Yep. Watch the tides. And so all, that's what everybody did. I mean, because you don't want to work harder than you have to. <laughs> so, so, yeah, yeah it's, uh, <laughs> the, river, the rivers are like the freeways. Or even the internet today. Here we are on Zoom. Yeah. So exactly coming together. So okay. So I am yeah. almost certain that I've been talking too much and we've been gone on too long. So BJ, let's do the last question. Um, as someone who's worked for decades to repair the river and support the communities along it, what do you hope will come of the increased awareness your book will bring? Why does it matter that people care about the river? Mm. Well. Um, from my perspective, you know, we made choices about the value that this river had, right, um, over a century ago. Transportation corridor, waste corridor, you know, what have you. Um, and those choices really, really dramatically impacted our landscape. So as a result, you know, of our values, of our choices, we built an industrial wall around the river um, that made it, today makes it very difficult, you know, for people to connect. But in its essence, you know, the Duwamish isn't just grandmother to people like James Rasmussen. Um, it's grandmother to the city of Seattle, right? Mm -hmm. the, the river birthed this city, it was built from the resources um, on the backs of this river. And um, if we want to understand who we are and who we can be, where we can go as a city, um, we need to understand the river's role in both our history and in our future. So that's, you know, I guess that's why I wrote the book. Um, it's what I want people to think about. I really want folks to understand where we came from so we can figure out where it is we want to go. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. More knowledge, more power. <laughs> so I, with that, I will say thank you so much. I, what an opportunity to get to talk to you all. So thank you for having me and thank you for sharing your thoughts. And I will pass it over to Grace to um, lead the question and answer. Thank you all for such a fascinating and eye-opening discussion. Um, I know that we're all very grateful to have been a part of it. Um, I have a few questions from the audience and these are open to any of you. So feel free to jump in whenever you wanna say anything. The first question is actually about BJ's very striking necklace. Is your <laughs> necklace or pendant the Duwamish River? Because um, a very curious attendee would like to know. <laughs> it, it absolutely is. Very good eye to whoever. Wow. <laughs> um, it is. It is the, the lower Duwamish River before it became a straight line. Um, and it was. Um, it was a gift that made me cry. <laughs> it was a gift from a silver artist uh, from South Park, now lives in West Seattle by the name of Wendy Waldenberg. And she is still around. I think she may have made a handful of similar ones, but um, this one's mine. That's absolutely beautiful. Um, the other question had to do with your very fascinating Google Earth tour, and um, someone would like to thank you for that. And it was a really great tour, so thank you for sharing that with us. How polluted is a Duwamish in comparison to five, 10, 20 years? And what are the current plans for cleanup? Did you guys hear me? I suppose that's also a question. Yeah, can you hear okay. me? I just, got a, I just got a notice that my internet's unstable. So apologies in advance if something glitches here. We can um, hear you now. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Compared to just 10 years ago, maybe even just five, I'm not going to do quite enough math in my head to figure that out. Um, we've actually made, we've made a lot of progress. So the river has been a super fun site for almost 20 years. Uh, next year will be the 20th anniversary of the super fun listing. And um, a handful of really, really even more highly polluted hot spots on the river were identified and cleaned up. So there were, um, I believe it was five early action cleanups that removed uh, an estimated 
of the PCBs, which is one of our most toxic um, and widespread chemicals in the river, um, those, those five uh, hotspot cleanups removed about 50% of the PCBs from the river, um, which isn't nearly enough, <laughs> but, but it is progress. So the river-wide planning is now underway, engineering, where is it all going to go? How are we going to take it out? How are we going to make sure it works? How do we know it's going to be permanent? How do we stop ongoing pollution? from recreating the problem, that's all happening now. So even though we've waited 20 years, it's gonna be about another 20 years before we're done. Okay, thank you. And our um, I have a question for Louise. You said you grew up in Colville, Kettle Falls area. What was your relationship to the Columbia River there? Well, my family were great fishermen and actually I have a great aunt who was a better fisherman than all the men but uh, that river was, was a part of our lives. Uh, my dad even built his own boat so that he could be on that, the, well, the river, it's Lake Roosevelt. Um, so I grew up fishing um, on all the different streams. I didn't do a lot of fishing on the Duwamish, although there was one time when my uncle cleared their blackberries just near Fort Dent so that we could fish off of his dock into the original part of the Duwamish River, right above the Blacks. So not knowing I had any relationship with the Duwamish or the Pioneers, I was actually dipping my feet in that river. It was very special. It sounds very special. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Kim, this one's for you. Um, people would, are really curious about what the status is currently for the Duwamish tribe receiving federal recognition. Uh, we're still not federally recognized, and the government said you have no more options, but our, our uh, pro bono um, lawyers, Ken L. Gates, they said, okay, how do you want to proceed? And so we said, we want to continue this battle in court, and so that's where we are, and that's where we've been for about a year now. Uh, thank you. And this may also be something that you could answer, but anyone can. Um, as a large presence along the river, is Boeing involved in the cleanup at all? Well, they have been, yeah. And uh, I've been very impressed with them. And so they've cleaned up their plant too, BJ. Is that the one where they built all the 17s, the B-17s? Yeah. <clears throat> they have used the closed bucket satellite mapping technology to clean this river up. So rather than having a big scoop come down in and just scoop stuff up and all kinds of spillage, they were using, the Boeing company, a closed bucket that would seal and then pull the stuff up and deposit it. And they were using satellites to map out where the next bucket load would come from. So it was really quite an incredible operation. And so then they built a, a shaded area just down there off of the old headquarters, um, a little backwater so the fry can come in there. And they put in by shaded area, they put in stumps and logs and gravel and all of this. And so as these fry migrate down for, um, towards the salt water, this is where they hang out right in this little estuary. And so they become acclimated to salt water. And so the numbers were picking up by massive amounts of numbers. And this is uh, a gentleman that I talked to about three years ago, maybe two years ago when he was telling me all of this. Okay, so thank you. Uh, uh, yeah, was, were you gonna say something? Yeah, uh, the plant, Boeing plant two on the river was one of those five, uh, Wor you know, worst of the worst um, contaminated areas that were part of the early action cleanup. Um, and Boeing, Boeing did do, as, as Ken said, um, a really excellent job. One of the most significant things that Boeing did when it cleaned up its one mile long reach of the river um, right there across from South Park was rather than take out the minimum amount that they could, um, they decided to remove everything, all of the contaminated mud they could find in the river, instead of capping it in place or monitoring it, they took it all out because that absolves them of any future liability for anything that get left, got left behind. 
And it also, in the long term, saved them money because they didn't have to do the monitoring and the maintenance on what they left mm -hmm. behind. They actually found that it was a good business decision to do the absolute best cleanup that they could. Okay, well, we're glad that they did that. <laughs> um, so uh, let's see. Um, a, uh, attendee had a question, again, from Ken, about his wonderment about being related to Chief Self. And they're on the bandwagon for the Duwamish being recognized and say, keep on. <laughs> well, uh, Quidid. Uh, Quidid is how we would say thank you. <laughs> Quidid, Twal Dugwee Hutch. Uh, thank you for your heart. <laughs> um, the wonderment, yeah, it can kind of came as a surprise. Um, I didn't know it. A co-worker um, discovered it. And so later, you know, I knew that I was Duwamish and you ask questions when you're young. And of course you're told, don't ask those questions. And then I said, I'm going to ask grandma, don't, don't ask grandma, whatever you do. And so finally, I think I was 54, 53, 55, somewhere around in there. I, uh, be, I inquired at a family reunion, Christmas reunion. I said, Hey mom, you know, what's the whole Duwamish family tree thing? So my mother said, well, I don't know, ask your aunt. My aunt gave me a family tree and I took it to work and I showed it to a friend and he started looking through the Mormon archives. And he said, Ken, you better look at this. <laughs> and so I went, whoa, okay. I went back and I told the family, hey, you know all that royal stuff you guys keep talking about, how we're, we're German, we got a castle or something like that in our history? It's the wrong, wrong people. It's the Indian people. <laughs> so, so yeah, it really came as a surprise. Um, and so I, there's nothing I can really do with it. I mean, I, I didn't have anything to do with it. I'm just here saying, hey, have a good time. I'm glad to answer any questions I can. The language seems to come easy to me. So I don't know why that is. All right, thank you. And we have time for three last questions. Um, were there specific negotiation methods that you used to get everyone to play well together during the cleanup process? That's probably for you, BJ. <laughs> I, I don't know if everyone played well together. <laughs> um, I would say that uh, everyone did, whether they were in agreement or not, everyone communicated throughout the entire process you know and I mentioned earlier um, you know ultimately I think we all want the same thing we all want to be healthy we all want to be whole you know and we want this river cleanup to help us um, achieve that goal and while there were certainly folks you know that said fishermen are just going to have to do without or the tribe is just going <laughs> to have to do without, or industry is just going to have to do without, um, you know, ultimately that's not a workable solution. So where we are now, um, I would say, is a, is a hopeful place where I think everyone is working together. We have a cleanup plan. You know, we know what's expected. We know what's required. How we're going to get there and whether we're going to be in a hole when we do is now the question. And so I would actually say that we're at a better place working together now that the, 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 the groundwork is laid, you know, so that we all kind of have a, we're all working from this, the same set of assumptions and um, EPA has put together something it calls the round table and everybody's there. The tribe is there, the neighborhoods are there, industry is there, EPA is there, the Port of Seattle is there, um, fishing community is there and everybody's talking and that's, that's the way forward. Okay, well that is good to hear. Um, what is the thinking about nature forcing the Duwamish to meander again? Will that be provided for or prevented? I'm not sure I fully understand the question, but um, you know, we have we have two percent of original habitat still on the river. I mean, almost nothing. Um, but we do have one original river meander that bend. You know, that we kept looking at at the beginning, um, and. In the last 30 years, actually, it began before the cleanup began, um, we've been restoring habitat on the river. So, you know, that 2% of original habitat is now complemented by maybe another 2 or 3% of restored habitat, but growing all the time. And um, 
I don't know that we'll see full meanders restored. I don't know if that's even something that all of the, you know, any of the parties would, um, would fully get behind, but we are restoring off-channel habitat. We are creating meanders. We are creating intertidal areas off the main channel as we do restoration. And because the Superfund cleanup has a component that requires restoration, that is happening and that will continue to happen. Um, one of the newest places, if anybody is interested in going and taking a look, is in South Park, just um, upriver south of the 14th Avenue Bridge that comes into South Park, there is a enormous brand new restoration project being constructed now, and it will have off-channel meanders, intertidal salmon spawning habitat, public viewpoints. Um, it's going to be a real gem when it's done. Okay, thank you. And now our last question about the book is from an attendee. It says, I'm looking forward to getting and reading the book. Does it include locations of previous and current historic places of the Duwamish people and other tribes? Uh, it has some information. Um, much of that information is intentionally not made public with great specificity. Um, and even though I would love for everybody to buy this book and read this book, um, I think that uh, I would actually also refer you to Cole Thrush's Native Seattle, Histories of the Crossing Over Place, which dives into um, the locations and details and place names of, um, of important Native places throughout the Seattle area, including the Duwamish. So read that one too. Thank you so much. And I'm afraid that's all the time we have today. Thank you, BJ, Jennifer, Louise, and Ken for the fascinating and informative presentation today. And a very special thank you to you, our audience, for joining us and participating in this very important discussion. For those of who, you who joined in after the intro, you may purchase copies of BJ's new book, The River That Changed Seattle from University Bookstore. She even stopped by to socially distance sign our copies and those signed copies are available now. Um, the books are selling really quickly. So we have another signing scheduled with her next week. Um, so if there's a slight delay um, in your book fulfillment, please bear with us, but it just means the book is selling really quickly and that's a really good thing. So thank you again for um, this great discussion and um, have a great night, everyone. Thank you, Grace. Thank Louise, you. Ken, thank you both so much. Jennifer, Bye. thank you.